thank you for that. I was afraid you were going to set expectations really, really high, and I kind of feel like you might have a little bit, so I apologize. So I also apologize that this is going to get a little weird really quick, because talking about authenticity is a little bit like um, performing an autopsy with a severed head, right? It's not a great tool for talking about uh, authenticity. And even sustainability, it, throw that into the mix, and it gets a little bit more weird. So I think anytime someone comes up and they say, well, I'm going to talk about authenticity, you kind of want to get a good sense of who they are pretty quick. Um, so what I tried to do is I Googled myself to see what other people were saying about me. I don't recommend Googling yourself. Um, and then the second, the second mistake I made was I clicked on the images tab. Um, so these are John Rooks's. Um, so there's me as a German guy. I, I like paper mache French fries. Um, next row down in the middle, that's me clearly as like a golfer salesman. Um, that's me on my wedding day. That's me at my best friend's wedding on the far right. The third row kind of scared me. I started seeing the, um, the, uh, the police lineup shots, mug shots. And like, there was like a brief moment in the 80s where that, those, that could have been me. So that scared me a little bit. Um, sort of bottom row, few, well, that's me with a lobster as a kid, I guess. And then there's a guy who looks like me with a beard, and then that's me with a beard. Um, so that's, that's, so these are all John Rooks's, so you don't know which one's gonna show up and talk today. Um, um, so let me tell you a little bit about soap. Um, so we sort of interact, we, we, we operate at the intersection of, of three roads, really. Um, it's science, uh, language, and culture. Um, and so our best work has those three ingredients in it. And I'm going to talk about a couple of the projects we've done as case studies that we can learn from. Um, the other company that I'm involved with is, um, uh, has a mission of democratizing sustainability. There is a sense in which um, sustainability um, is only for people who can afford it. Um, and so what we've done is we've taken um, a lot of the lessons we've learned over the last 20 years uh, in sustainability, turned it into uh, an engagement platform um, designed specifically for small, mid-sized businesses, designed and priced for small and mid-sized businesses. Again, trying to bring it, uh, sort of bring it to the masses, as it were, um, for companies that can't afford, um, you know, sixty, hundred thousand dollars software applications. We designed rapport because we believe that um, it's about a better relationship between data and people, right? And so that's really what we're doing with both the Soap Group and rapport. So. These things have a couple things in common. They have people in common, for sure. That's a lens at which we look at sustainability quite a bit. But there's also this lens of authenticity. So we do authenticity audits um, on, our, on our clients. Um, and if you ever want to clear out a room of CEOs, tell them you're there to do the authenticity audit. Um, um, so we do authenticity audits to sort of figure out how real. And there's a, there's a real protocol that we can follow to do that, and what it exposes is it exposes opportunities and risks. It's that simple. The way we define authenticity is uh, the difference between what you say and what you do. So it's really, it really gets that simple. So that's a lens at which we approach everything, is this lens of culture and authenticity. So I want to unpack reality a little bit. I want to unpack what authenticity is from a cultural perspective to start with. So let's look at some instances. We can see it in, in, in food behavior, right? Where you go out for an authentic Italian dinner, right? Clearly not an authentic Italian dinner. Still valuable, but not an authentic dinner. And on the other side of that uh, spectrum, we've got slow food movements. And we've got 400% um, you know, increase in farmers markets. People who do want to have that real experience with food. So culturally, we start to see two, two, uh, two ends of a, of a spectrum for how people engage with authentic experiences. We see it in vacations and tourism, right? So we have a completely manufactured version of, of, of tourism, right? Where nothing about it is real, and it's an escapism opportunity. Um, and on the other side, we see things like voluntourism and staycations and business models like Airbnb where you are going and staying in somebody's real home, right? As opposed to fabricating an experience. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about fabricated experiences versus real things uh, that, have, that have additional values. In Total Recall, what they do is 
they have uh, memories implanted in their brain. They don't go on vacations. They don't have uh, perfect Thanksgivings, right? They have the memory of vacations and the memory of the perfect Thanksgiving implanted into their brains. I would argue that going on a Disney cruise might not be any different than just having a memory implanted into your brain, right? And so these are the things that we're looking at. And this is, we are very close to this state, not from a technology perspective, but the way we interact with people, right? The way that we manufacture um, our day-to-day -day, uh, lives is very, very close to just having the memory of the thing uh, implanted with us. We see this concept of semblance, right? Which is, the, it's supposed to be the thing, but it's not. So this is a hotel in Hawaii just on the other side of those rocks is an actual river, an actual play thing, an actual place where people could go do this. But people are willing to accept the, the semblance of the thing because it's more convenient over the thing itself. So these are the opportunities and these are the experiences that people are willing to accept instead of the real thing. Again, 400 yards away, it's the real experience. But they'd rather have the convenience of this. There is a sense in which a lot of this authenticity is tied up in sort of our over-digitized um, sense of being right now. Um, but I don't think that's all of it. But in that instance, we do see Instagram, right? So there's this amazing technology in your pocket to make high-resolution pixel photographs. And what do we do with them? We filter them to make them look like Polaroids, right? And so at the same time that we're using this digitized, synthesized experience, we still want it to look like the original. We want it to feel like there's a nostalgia tied up in authenticity that we sort of clamor for in some cases. But we don't use the real thing to do it. We use technology to get us there. We see this in branding a lot. So my son Charlie is 14. He bought that Wu-Tang shirt from Target. He has no idea who Wu-Tang is. He has no <laughs> but he wants that brand. Right? And it's, you know, and, it's, and it's manufactured to look old, right? We, we, this, this started with sort of genes, but we, we're, th these are the, we want to have the appearance of authenticity and reality more than we are the thing itself. Certainly, we see things like PBR coming back with sort of the, you know, this uh, hipster culture of you know, wanting to be seen as sort of blue collar, working class. So that brand has been co-opted to reinforce a brand. And then we see you know, uh, beverage companies with their throwback sodas because it's made with real sugar, right? <laughs> right? Like, isn't that funny? It's, still, it's, you know, it's not better, it's just real, right? Um, and so there's these really interesting things that we can get tangled up in. And of course, social media has to come into the conversation. Aaron Sorkin, screenwriter for The Social Network, the movie about Facebook, said, socializing on social media is like, real is like reality is to reality TV. Right? So socializing on social media is like reality on reality TV. We know reality TV is not real. And we should also sort of know that socializing on social media isn't real either. It's all performance, right? You're performing fitness, or you're performing indulgence, or sympathy, perhaps. Um, but it's not the real thing. It's always removed at least once from the real thing itself. Don Draper said, um, what you people call love, people like me invented to sell more nylons. Right? And we can think about this in terms of sustainability. We can think of some companies that said, what people like you call sustainability, people like me invented to sell Priuses or invented to sell ice cream, or milk, or anything really, right? So what we're being sold is not necessarily what we're buying. But we're always given this perfect picture of sustainability. The, the stock photography sustainability, right? That, this is what the, the sustainability reports have always been littered with, and advertising has been littered with. They're replicas of something that doesn't exist. That's the simulacrum. It's a replica of something that doesn't exist. These are what we've become to accept as sustainability. It's perfection. There's a perfectness to all of this um, that culturally we really don't question enough. So um, I mentioned that talking about um, authenticity um, can be sort of slippery. 
um, partially because it's hard to know it when you see it. And so um, Potter Stewart, Supreme Court Justice, said, um, I can't describe hardcore pornography, but I know it when I see it. And I think authentic sustainability is kind of the same thing. It's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it. So here is an example of authenticity. Um, and I, I want to underscore, underscore this point. This is what authenticity looks like. Somewhere in the distance, we heard the pounding of native drums. <laughs> So it's, it's authentic because it's, it's imperfect, right? And we don't see imperfection enough in sustainability when we're, talk, when we're communicating what our companies are doing. And we, we, we are drawn to this type of thing because breaking is, well, break, breaking is really what made Jimmy Fallon's career. But, um, uh, but, but it makes him more authentic, more real, sort of vulnerable. And we don't see that enough in sustainability. Instead, we get this. Right? Where even the, even the unsustainable side is still perfect, right? It's still a, it's still a sort of this uh, simulacrum of, a, of you know, something that, uh, you know, a copy that doesn't have an original. Um, so this is what we're up against when we start talking about what real engagement looks like and what real sustainability looks like. It's going to require us to be a little bit more vulnerable as we go through this. So I'm going to tell you two stories today, sort of two case studies from two different types of companies, different ends of the sustainability spectrum. Uh, one, Interface Carpet, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, and Vans, the um, outdoor lifestyle uh, company, um, uh, who I'm also, I imagine you're, you're familiar with. Very different goals, very different places of where they were um, when they started, uh, when they think about approaching sustainability. The work for Interface started with a challenge. It was our goal is zero. That's part of their mission zero objective, zero environmental, negative environmental footprint by 2020. Um, our goal is zero, but where are we today? And are our employees on board with this mission? So they have about 4,000 employees um, around the globe, own most of their own manufacturing. Um, and that was the question. How are we doing? Where are we? But specifically through their employees' lens. Um, so what I want to walk through is show you some video of the project that we did. So here's what we did. We went to five countries, uh, seven of their factories. We performed 500 interviews, um, 20 go homes. So what we used was documentary filmmaking as the research methodology for this. So the process also became the product at the end of it. So we would go to these facilities. Uh, we'd produce little 15-minute documentaries uh, that said, um, this is what sustainability looks like. And it was a very sort of warts and all picture, as you'll see in some of the videos. Um, really authentic looks at what sustainability um, felt like. The go homes were amazing. We'd get to go home, have dinner with employees. We'd go with them when they went on volunteer, uh, volunteer outings. Um, and we got to see how they translated um, an interface version of sustainability into a home-based version of sustainability. And we found those stories all over throughout the entire organization. Uh, ended up with about 500 hours of footage. Um, uh, it was about an 18-month project, all to measure their concept of zero environmental footprint before 2020. When we started the project, it's interesting, um, you know, there was already an argument internally of, you know, when Ray Anderson set this goal in 96, did he mean January 2020 or December 20? There's all, they're already looking for some wiggle room, I think. <laughs> um, but they're having that conversation now. Or they, they, you know, We started this project a few years ago. Um, so uh, just a quick little sort of some vignettes of some of the people we met around the world. There are some subtitles in some of these. Um, just these are the people that we were talking to. And this is, what, um, this is how they, they uh, sort of personified Mission Zero. I am 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 Mission Zero. 
I am Mission Zero. I am Mission Zero. I am Mission Zero. I am Mission Zero. I am Mission Zero. You bet. I am Mission Zero. 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 And I am Mission Zero. I am Mission Zero. I am Mission Zero. I am Mission Zero. With as much enthusiasm as you can muster up. I am Mission Zero. 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 We are Mission Zero. Mission Zero. Okay, so what's interesting about that sort of fun clip that we just sort of put together as sort of a, a gag reel at the end was you can see that sustainability is very, very different in every culture, right? And so when we're thinking about designing engagement platforms, whether it's for supply chains within different cultures or our own employees, um, in different cultures, um, they, it has to be relevant to them because they approach it in very different ways. So all sustainability is local. If Interface had come out with a, you know, a central vision of what sustainability was and tried to apply that to each of their facilities, they wouldn't be where they are today. They let the employees and they let the companies interpret what sustainability means in their own, in their own ways, in their own words, uh, based on what's going on around them based on what's a, what's a relevant reward system. I'll tell you, it's very different. Designing a reward, an incentive system for sustainability is very different in Thailand than it would be in the Netherlands. Um, you could see that the, the, the associates in Thailand were very sort of um, exuberant, right? And they were very excitable. And you could see the folks in the Netherlands were very um, engineered and very methodic in, in the way they were approaching it. So here's some, here's some things that came out. Um, from all the videos as we were thinking about this relevancy issue and how do we then go and build a platform um, or platforms for sustainability. Het belangrijkste is dat je ze de kans geeft om uit te vinden wat Mission Zero voor hen betekent. Dus dat ze het kunnen vertalen in hun dagelijkse werkzaamheden. Every day you can see the, the negative uh, impact on, on the environment that we're facing daily. In Thailand we recently faced a very severe flood which has never happened before, or happened once uh, 50, 60 years ago. You know, so uh, those kind of things are, is driving um, uh, a Mission Zero, basically. It's, it's giving, giving um, meaning to the, to the efforts that we're putting into. Warum heeft Interface het ambassadors programma? En dat is eigenlijk om ervoor te zorgen dat meer mensen betrokken raken bij het programma Duurzaamheid. We have a riverbank that runs parallel to our factory here. Uh, and we have a volunteer team going out and we're going to start the restoration project of Red Bank Creek. It's not much of a creek, but it's our creek. Very important because these people in the local community work here at Interface. We are part of the community. Because once employees buy into that sort of local community type program, it's so much easier for them to actually understand Mission Zero and what we're trying to achieve as a company. Ethical disposal of um, old lamps has been an issue here for quite some time because we, we've got literally hundreds of light fittings. We've been running the lamp process for about 18 months to two years now. We've only been running the battery uh, process for about six months and I think I've sent back about um, eight buckets were for batteries. Like I said, I always feel pretty safe uh, doing this sort of stuff. Um, occasionally you might get a, a kick, kick in the butt, but I figure it's worth it. <laughs> the, the thing at work, you know, being told about all these things that you got to do for the environment, got me thinking about all this stuff. We wanted to have more uh, energy efficient home, so what we did is we changed the windows. We put in different uh, plants and stuff to uh, trees to uh, help us with uh, energy saving by keeping the house cooler. Then the job came up at Interface, I went and worked there and I thought, well, this company's really fair income about sustainability. 
Um, and that sort of bred back through the property, got me more, more interested and started thinking about how can I do this without bringing things inside, how can I start to look after the land better and make it sustainable uh, for the future. Once we started, once we got the original cow um, and the original chalks, that's basically it. We just keep on going and regenerating um, and feeding back into the property more than what we take out. So what we try and do is fertilise the vegetable patch with the cow manure and then the, the water and nutrients run down through the ground um, and feed the, feed the fruit trees. What I've learnt about sustainability is you know, even through the little things like putting trash in the right bins, paper in paper, plastic in plastic, like it all counts in the end, you know. Hopefully through encouraging the people that work here, it'll sort of branch off and um, we can encourage others to sort of follow suit on what we're doing. In uh, my house, I teach my mom, my father, especially my father, I teach my father to how separate everything, the cans, the bottles, the paper. I've got a 13 year old that's always chasing me around, turning off lights and turning off faucets, even when I'm not done. I'm always talking about what I do in my professional life and how I translate that into my personal life and I probably annoy my friends and family about it quite a bit um, but I've been able to um, influence them quite a bit into helping them understand why sustainability should be important to them, um, how it can help them live healthier, happier, um, be more connected to their community, to their environment, to their society. It's part of my job but it doesn't feel like it's part of my job. It's just the way we are, it's the way we operate, it's the way we live at home. <laughs> So there's um, so the Australian guy who was talking about the battery program and the light program. A um, couple of notes on him. One, literally, his nickname is Sparky, and it's, I just love that he's an electrician and his nickname is Sparky. Um, and second, what he said is really important. He sort of said, um, um, "I don't always ask for permission to these stuff, so I guess it's it's sort of okay to get a kick in the pants every once in a while. It's worth it, right?" And that's a lesson that we learned was that in a lot of these facilities, they had built this "it's okay to fail" culture. Right, so that people try things. And I think it's a really important piece for people to, for people to remember. Um, the other thing is the, the last gentleman um, from Australia who was talking about his farm, that was one of those instances where as we went into these facilities, and we'd be there for about three weeks, we'd go uh, with a pre-team uh, uh, pre before about a week just to get to know people, no cameras, um, and then the camera crew would show up um, a week later. But we were looking for stories, and, and they weren't that hard to find. But in his case, he's like, no, I really don't have much of a story. I just have a little hobby farm. And he's got like eight cows and fruit trees all over the place. But he had totally re-engineered the farm based on what he learned working at Interface. And we saw that story over and over and over again. And Interface suspected it was happening, but they wanted data. They wanted us to research and find out if it was. Um, but we found that story of people learning things at work and then bringing them home and, and, and uh, bringing it to their, to, their, uh, to their families as well. So I think that's, that's sort of an important les lesson. Um, the other thing that is, is very true, um, you know, there's, it's a manufacturing uh, company. There's certainly turnover um, on the factory floor. Um, and so there is a concept that this is weird. Sustainability is weird for a lot of businesses. And it was no different and is no different at Interface. Like I didn't know what sustainability was till I came here. When I first started working here, it took me a little while to understand what sustainability was because I hadn't heard of it. I never heard about sustainability until I work here. In the beginning, it was kind of strange. We didn't really know what it was. I was not an environmentally conscious person at all. I, at first, I was kind of like fighting it, you know. It took a while for everybody to get on board. They presented it to us, and then we started gradually getting into it, learning more about it. You know, it's like everything new. You have to learn more about it, just get involved. So that's what we all do now, get involved in it. If you're not doing anything sustainable, when you come here, you will start. And uh, you'll think about the things you do and the things you throw away. I probably used to think about more sustainability more when I first started here five years ago than I do now. And it's not to say that I don't think about sustainability now, I just think it comes more naturally. I think I had to make myself think about it when I first started here and Interface has taught me a lot. So the, the note here is that you know, there are, there's sort of mythologies built up around these hyper sustainable, super sustainable companies. Um, but the reality is it's still weird for a lot of them, for employees that are coming in. 
So you really need to sort of do the work to educate people on an ongoing basis. Everyone comes in starting from a different place. And understanding what that place is will inform the sustainability platforms that you end up building. And the idea behind this whole thing is to get employees engaged so that they help you make progress, so that they come up with new ideas. How do you really get people inspired about sustainability mm -hmm. and that direction where we're going? It's not as easy as just telling them, hey, this is our goal, and that's it. It's, hey, this is our goal, and this is how we want to achieve it. Where can you participate in this? I think everybody has to, to play their part. I think that when we're out here and we have the recycled containers, we should recycle properly. We should put things in the recycled container as they're designed for. I think every associate has a part in, in, in uh, part of the Mission Zero. It's how do we get employee ideas and put them up there for everybody to see. Here's an idea somebody had, and here's what we're doing to work on it or here's how we're addressing that. The one point lessons in Vele, Ferrandering Mazin, Yafan in Clean Summer Mat, Mazin, okay, the Fell Groot Dinga Devot, Selma Oscar Food, or Ferbetered, Dor Ide, Fan Mede Verkes. This land looms that a Ferbetter point. I see is it that each can Ferrand, a lot Ferrand that for better vote can outpack for be drive, that that idea of Kissamo Papier. As mensen a good idea have. En we zien dat ze daar heel druk mee zijn en het, 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 het komt tot een goed idee. We belonen ze niet in het materieel opzicht, de waardigheid van de mensen, het, 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 de mensen trots maken, dat proberen we, trots te maken op het idee wat ze, wat ze verzonnen hebben, dat is een idee, dat voorzien je. En dat het ook uitgewerkt is aan de, aan de lijn of in de fabriek of in heel interface. Those ideas help a lot. Especially from the guy who's been doing the same thing every day for eight hours a day for a year, he's probably got a fairly good idea how to do that. And if it can be improved, uh, you ought to, ought to listen to that. The project that I for my level three uh, training have done was to try to reduce the number of personal printers. Now, in fact, I'm a customer service for a while. At that time, we were the first company to sell the printers. ไปบริจาคให้กับโรงเรียนคนตาบอดพระมหาไถ่ที่พัทยาเพราะว่าเป็นกระดาษสองหน้าใช้แล้วล่ะค่ะแต่คราวนี้คือเขาใช้เป็นอักษรเบล Well the, the, one of the concepts of lean is that you're really looking to grow your employees and that the people who are doing the work know what needs to be done The key to this is our people and we're lucky because we've got the best people in the world I mean this is you know all of the experts in the copper tile business work for interface You sort of feel that pride there that woman that was talking about um, from Thailand, like, I love that story. So they were recycling all of their paper using both sides of all their paper. And then she realized that they could donate it to a blind school and they could print Braille on it. So they actually got another use out of the paper. And that was an employee idea that I just, I think, I think it's, a, it's a miraculous idea. Um, so the, one of the reasons that they the design these systems the way they do is because, as you can tell, each culture has a very, very different sort of set of rules for ideation and incentives. In the Netherlands, they would never, they would never uh, consider um, a financial incentive for somebody who came up with an idea. But in Los Angeles, they would do that. Um, and so the incentive systems that you build have to be culturally relevant. And I want to be really, really careful here that when, I'm not just talking about broad sort of, um, you know, geo, geographic cultures, political you know, areas. This is true for all corporate culture as well. So it's macro culture, yes, but it's also micro culture. Um, it has to be relevant to the business that you're running in order to, to generate these kinds of ideas. Um, um, it, has to, it has to have meaning. So the company's journey is that. We asked, uh, we asked uh, is it possible? Is, um, is, sustainable, is, is mission zero possible? Um, and this is what we, these are some things we heard. The company's journey is that, you know, by 2020, you know, we're not taking anything out of the ground that can't be re, reused or can't be, you know, regenerated. Als je, als je naar de missie SEC kijkt en, en, en vraagt van kunnen we dat nou halen? 
kunnen we echt helemaal geen impact meer op de aarde hebben. Nou, dat, vind ik, dat vind ik een hele moeilijke vraag. Ik ben niet zeker dat we daar zullen komen in 2020. Voor mij is het echt meer over de journey en de conversaties die het creëert. Nou, weet je, ik denk dat we, dat we al heel ver zijn. Maar om, uh, om misschien zero 2020, dat, ik denk niet dat wij dat helemaal gaan halen. We hebben wel meer tijd nodig, zeg maar. Misschien vijf jaar, misschien drie jaar, maar we hebben wel iets meer tijd nodig. Ik denk dat we heel goed bezig zijn, maar we hebben wel iets, iets meer tijd nodig dan... If I were to guess, I would probably say we're probably, we're probably in the 40 to 50 percent range. Between 85 and 90 percent of the way. 60 percent or more. I'm not certain. And I would like to know. Because if we only have eight years left, years pass by fast. A lot can happen in eight years. A lot can happen by the end of the year. It's got to be a plan. It's got to be continue. You know, I don't think anything you do in life that gonna be gonna help the environment is gonna be a slide. So we'll come close to it. It's it's a big ask to have no impact. I really, I honestly think that. But I think if we can have almost no impact, well, that's better than a massive impact. You know, we're we're still ahead. I think there's a lot of um, different understandings of what Mission Zero actually is within the business. Um, I think I think they have the determination to do it without a doubt and the belief that they can do it. I don't know that it will actually happen. But I think sometimes the belief and the determination is enough even if it doesn't happen. Si todos ponemos un pedacito, eso se, se puede cumplir. If we don't make it by 2020, look what we've achieved anyway and we just keep going. So we make it in 2021, 2025. It, it doesn't really matter the year. It's the fact that you're on the journey and you're gonna get there, and you're not gonna stop until you get there. And that last bit is important, right? So when you're setting, um, you know, big audacious goals like zero, um, you know, the lesson is not to build, not to build the story around the metrics, but around the journey for the metrics. Um, and I think that that's often lost. We get so so tangled up in setting goals and hitting goals and measuring that we forget that the journey, right? I think a lot of sustainability um, is, um, uh, gets that, that piece of it gets lost. It's almost the difference between the value in reporting versus the value of a report, right? Um, the value in reporting has a lot of things. There's a lot of light, there's a lot of lessons in there, there's knowledge that can be shared. The value in a, a, a hard 48 page report is sort of somehow less valuable than the concept of always being reporting. And so these were all shot um, as internal learning projects. They were not to be shared outside of the organization. That gave us a lot of freedom. It gave the associates a lot of freedom. Um, we could really go anywhere in any facility and talk to anybody we want because of that constraint, that these were never to be shared. But what ended up happening is, as soon as we'd send it to the facility, um, it would pop up on YouTube because they were sort of proud of it, right? They, were, they, they liked showing that they didn't know where they were, right? So these are sort of slice of life for all of these documentaries, but each one is 15, 10, 15 minutes and is a fairly cohesive story that shows what it looks like in Thailand and Netherlands and Northern Ireland and what it looks like in all these places. One of the things we, we learned pretty quickly is that they're really good at capturing data, but they weren't so good at capturing knowledge. So they could say, our footprint here went down, and they could share that with their associates around the world, but they didn't share why and how. And so that was one of the, that, that was one of the opportunities that we had, was to start building those knowledge, not just data sharing systems, but knowledge sharing systems. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we did this, is so that we could show other facilities. We found instances where a problem had been solved in one facility, uh, for years, and other facilities were still spending a lot of energy and time trying to solve that same problem. There was no knowledge sharing. So what are the lessons here? Push through the weird part, it's worth it, and it'll always be weird. Every new employee that comes into your businesses doesn't know the whole story, right? So it's going to be weird, and it's continually weird, and it should be. We need to find ways to make it personally relevant, design systems that support the culture where it's okay to fail, um, this is easier to do in some cultures than it is in other cultures. Um, set aggressive goals, but build the culture around the journey, right? So not around whether or not we hit the goal. Um, build it around the journey. And then use stories to share data 
not the other way around. I think when we talk about reporting, we oftentimes do it the other way around, and we think data is the story, but data is not always the story. So that's, that's, uh, that's, the, that's one project we did for, for Interface. Um, let me tell you uh, this, this case study that we did for Vans. So similar size, about 4,000 employees. Um, they don't own their own manufacturing. Um, but the way that it was teed up for us was, let's just say we have an irreverent culture, right? It's very much of a skate, still a skateboard company. While from a product category perspective, it's not so much anymore. Culturally, it's still a very skate-friendly culture. Um, they've got a combi pool in the back where they skate during breaks. Um, all the floors, all the floors are concrete so they can skate to and from to and from meetings. I mean, that's just sort of the culture they have. And they had started two or three um, sustainability initiatives, right? They tried to do their green team things, um, and they didn't stick. And so because of the irreverent nature of their culture, they kind of knew they only had one more shot at it. So like one more shot to really make it work. So they came to us and said, so how, how do we do this, right? How do we create a culturally relevant engagement platform for our associates? Um, and how do we tie that back to our business goals, um, et cetera. So the process we did with Vans was the first thing we did was called is a culture mapping um, project where we interviewed, we sent, it was an uh, email survey, online survey, um, to figure out where the associates were, right? Do they believe in the man, is man-made climate change? Do they believe in climate change? Do they think it's a hoax? Uh, do they, you know, um, do they recycle at home? Do they uh, think that recycling is a waste of energy? Uh, you know, where are they along the spectrum of sustainability as people, right? That's that's because again, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people, you know. And when they hear the word sustainability, what do they think of? Do they think of employee volunteer hours? Do they think of life cycle analysis? Are we talking about composting? Where are they along the platform? So we have to figure that piece out first in order to start to design this thing so that it matters to them. Next thing we did was interviews with uh, vice presidents, um, and we wanted to hear what their beliefs were. Do they believe in climate change? Um, and what were their specific corporate goals? And what are the barriers that they see to um, uh, building a sustainability platform that would engage their, their employers, uh, their employees, and ultimately their supply chains as well. Um, so we had to figure out those things are. So now we, now we know where the associates are, the employees are. Now we're starting to get a sense for where management sits. And these are some of the things that we heard. Uh, management said, I care, but employees don't. And then employees said, I care, but management doesn't. <laughs> All right. That's an easy barrier, right? That's, that, that's a barrier that we can solve really quickly without a lot of time and money. Um, we heard that skaters don't care from management. Um, but we heard from, uh, and then they said surfers care. That makes sense, right? So skating, you know, trash sort of becomes part of the game. It's the obstacle, the obstacle to, to, to ollie over. Um, but surfers care because they're in that environment, right? It's not so urban, it's more naturist. That makes sense. But then we heard from the associates, who are skaters and surfers, um, that they both care, right? So we had to dispel some myths there um, along the way. Um, and then the associates said, my boss won't support me. And then both of them said, margins are too tight, right? Margins are too tight to do anything meaningful. So now we've got our barriers. We've got our boundaries for the program. Uh, we know where we're starting. and. Um, and, and we know some of the things we have to design into the engagement platform to get past the uh, who cares and uh, margins are too tight issue. We then ran a series of workshops with associates only. No management were invited in three days with three different groups of associates. And we generated 170 ideas in those workshops of what could we do to start becoming a more sustainable business. So we took these 170 ideas and we had them categorize them into uh, in the game, uh, upping the game, or changing the game. We said, which, which one of these ideas falls into these buckets, right? So if it's some energy efficiency things, it's in the game. If it's um, 
you know, beat the box, getting rid of the box that shoes are shipped in, it's kind of a holy grail, that's a changing the game sort of mentality. Um, and we had them disclassify and we said, great, which bucket do you guys want to play in? Um, I was sort of expecting sort of the skate culture, um, let's just go for it, change the game. But they said, look, we're not doing anything right now. We just got to get in the game. So they were very sort of practical in there. Let's just start doing some things. So the next thing we did is we plotted all of the ideas on a grid, right? So sort of classic grid here. So we got high environmental impact at the top, low environmental impact at the bottom, hard to do, right? Easy to do. Guess which quadrant we're going to start in? Top left, high impact, easy to do. So now we're starting to zone in on some of these ideas. And these other ideas are still out there. Um, they're just further down the road. We're just going to build a plan that has those happening in two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, years. And we also organized them through um, the color codes of the, of the dots are related to, is it related to product and packaging? Is it um, employee engagement platform? Is it a business strategy? And there's a lot of business strategies in here because we had to anchor these into the margins are too tight piece. So they had to have business um, value as well. We, we, we knew that going into this. So we organized them, right? So the idea, move energy efficiency from a campaign to a policy. So instead of just talking about it, um, we're going to move it into a policy for the organization. They said, great, what are the specific barriers for this? Uh, management commitment was a barrier, employee resistance, and policing the policy, right? How are we going to police this if we make it a policy? That was a sort of a risk that they acknowledged. And then what are the business impacts? Well, if we do it, there will be cost savings involved. So again, we're sort of removing the concept that we can't do it because margins are too tight by creating platforms that um, um, uh, in, improve margins in, in a lot of cases. So we started to organize these, these ideas. We then uh, produced a five-year plan for them. Um, it says, look, here's when we're going to do which one of these ideas. We're going to formalize it in this way. Um, and we played it out for them for all the employees, and we're getting buy-in from them along the way. The next thing we had to do was we had to take these ideas and this concept and this opportunity and to put it into their own language, right? So we worked with one of the designers uh, in the design department um, and came up with it. He actually did this in one of the workshops. He sort of he photoshopped this while we were talking about it. He said, well, why don't we take one week of the trash and fill the combi pool overnight? So when guys go into, you know, uh, when women and guys go into to skate the next day, they really have a quick visual of what our impact is. So we want to really start contextualizing it within their own iconography and language system and making it, again, it's back to that, making it personal. The other thing we did was we started to use some of the, some of the, the outdoor lifestyle imagery. Um, um, so in Hawaii, ahakua'a is the way they used to uh, uh, divide the land. So they divide the land from the top of the mountain down to the water in sort of pie wedges, pie wedge shapes, so that everyone had access to all the different pieces of the land. So not one person had all the beachfront property. Someone, someone had the, the great land for growing, uh, the waters, et cetera. So they used to divide the land like this. So we started talking about their sustainability platform using this as a lens saying, look, okay, so we've got um, the pies are, we've got water, energy, land, and people. And then from this island mountain perspective, We've got their business uh, units. So snowboarding at the top of the mountain, um, biking um, on the trails, skate in the urban environments, and then surf down at the bottom. So we started to use some of the things that they already talk about um, and use uh, a sustainability-based iconography around it so that it felt more comfortable and natural for them. So the next thing we did was we had round tables with um, all the executives that we had interviewed in the first place, so they knew what we were up to, and we developed these commitment sheets. We went in with 40 requests, and we asked them to um, rank the request based on whether it was um, um, high resource or low resource request, what the resources were, and whether or not they were committed to following through on it. Um, and it was okay for them to say, I can't make a decision, I don't have enough information. Because what that meant was that meant that the sustainability manager now could have a conversation with them about something very real. Um, so it was, and it was also okay to say no, right? Uh, I think we went in here with the goal of getting six of the commitments made. That was sort of our year one target. 
and we got 19 commitments from the managers to support these initiatives. And some of them were fairly simple. Work with the sustainability manager to perform an LCA, LCA on the most uh, popular product. They're black on black classics. Just one product. Let's do that. Let's take a year and a half and do that. And that's all they needed to do. So sometimes it wasn't a big ask from them. They just had to agree that it was an important thing to do and that they were going to um, provide some leadership around it. Um, so we got 19 commitments out of, the, out of the management. So now we have employees who are psyched, employee-driven ideas, right? They came up with I these ideas. We're starting to see, um, we're starting to translate those ideas into action using their own language. Again, making it, re making it relevant to them. And we also start to see some top-down buy-in to support the ideas. So we take these, we go back to the employees, and we say, look at the work you did. Uh, management psyched about it. Let's go ahead and do it. And everyone is thrilled. Everyone's really happy. But there was one final step, and that was what we had to ask the CEO to do. And that was to bake the commitments into the VP's annual performance appraisals and really provide some accountability to these commitments that they were making. And we got that commitment. Um, this entire project took, I think it was about four months. It was really, really fast to go, um, to go from a company that said, we've only got one more shot at this thing, to uh, CEO commitment for these, for, you know, for these 19 ideas that employees had come up with. So lessons from this. So it's bottom up for ideas and top down for support. You got to understand why you're doing it. Um, why you're putting these initiatives out there. You got to acknowledge these barriers early. We wouldn't have been successful if we hadn't done the research to find out what the barriers were to start. Learning that a barrier where margins were too tight, we focused exclusively on ideas that either avoided that barrier or removed it by, by, uh, uh, by um, um, providing better margins in a lot of cases. That's sort of that low hanging fruit of sustainability stuff that we all know about. You know, it's that first 50% of, of sustainability saves you money um, type of math. Um, we had to connect the programs to the business goals, because again, this is not a company that is driven by mission, right? It's not a sustainability play based on mission. Um, so we had to connect it to the business goals, and we had to engineer the early wins. Um, you know, simple things like composting in the cafeteria that were visible, but also fairly easy to pull off um, so that uh, the associates could say, oh, it's working this time, and start to participate. And that starts to feed on itself. Um, so what connects these two, these two projects? Um, it's really building these platforms around um, authentic cultures. And for Interface, we had the opportunity to work with um, uh, very, very different cultures in, uh, so in the macro sense, but also in the micro sense. Um, and then for Vans, it was just a really specific sort of corporate culture that they had, uh, they had built. Um, that's all I got. You're awesome.